Okay, okay, so welcome to Statistical Physics 2. Um, so, in this, uh, in this course, the first eight lectures are uh, thermodynamics. So, at the end of those eight lectures, you will know thermodynamics well enough to uh, hopefully tackle just uh, any problem in thermodynamics. At least to think about it, we've got to read uh, more advanced books like Landau and Wisdom and, and, uh, and stuff like that. And the next seven lectures, we study statistical mechanics. Uh, thermodynamics is a geometrical theory. Um, what I mean by that is that properties of matter and, in, in a sense, the arrow of time. Uh, the direction of natural processes are encoded into the slopes and curvatures of a manifold. So that thermodynamics is a geometrical theory. So does anyone know any other geometrical theories in physics? You would have heard of it. You would have, wouldn't have studied it yet, but you would have heard of it. You heard of, you heard of one? Gen General relativity is a geometrical theory. Yeah. So thermodynamics is, has that similarity. Statistical mechanics, on the other hand, is what's called a microscopic theory. So based on microscopic properties uh, of the constituent particles, atoms, um, phonons, photons, um, skirmions, enions, uh, many of them together, uh, there are uh, collective effects well, effects whereby the fact that you have many of them uh, give a certain regularity, a certain predictability to experiments. Statistical mechanics is the theory of many body systems from the microscopic point of view. The, it's, it's kind of, I don't know, ironic is the wrong word, but odd in some sense. Most, almost none of you would have heard of statistical mechanics, even though roughly about a third of all Nobel Prizes have been given in the, in the subject. So why is that? Well, one reason is that in, in, in newspapers and popular science articles and there's kinds of things that you can read without actually studying uh, at a high level, uh, it's hard for journalists and uh, science communicators to convey the insights of statistical mechanics, um, the insights of many particle systems. And so you just don't get to hear about it. Quite often actually some of them really do seem magical, really, really uh, surprising if, uh, if you just think, of, uh, if you have your intuition it's just uh, contrary to your intuition. Well, we'll be uh, looking at that in the last seven lectures. The textbook is this one. Uh, Callum, um, get yourself a copy, it's important. You should read it absolutely thoroughly. It's quite, it's, uh, in some sense, it's a little bit difficult to read and you need a bit of effort. But when you actually succeed, you would have really achieved something because, in my opinion, uh, Callan is the best book on thermodynamics and it presents the theory uh, in, a, in a way that's more clear than pretty well any other uh, author. And Callan, in fact, made fundamental contributions to the field in the 1950s and 60s. He's, this book is idiosyncratic in the, sense, in the sense that it has his own vision of how thermodynamics uh, should be uh, viewed. So this book is about, there's many copies in the library. Uh, for those of you who can read Japanese, the Japanese translation has fewer misprints. Uh, this one, uh, the English, whichever edition you have in English, it always seems to have misprints that you have to be careful of. 
but get yourself a copy of this. Every now and then, I'll just mention something from a book called Zemansky and Dittman. Zemansky and Dittman is, a, is an excellent classic on film dynamics. It contains many the connections to experiment. So if you want to see the variety of applications of film dynamics, uh, uh, Szymanski and Dittman is, is worth having a look at. It's the classical development of, the standard development of uh, uh, teaching method of um, film dynamics. The other textbook that we'll use later is by Reif. Reif, this book was first published in 1965 and pretty, pretty much the same. Uh, Reif was a professor of physics at Harvard. Um, and it's just well, you know, one, another one of those books that is very well known. Another book you might want to try if you want a, a second opinion. For thermodynamics, the second, the second other, or the, another point of view is given by Zemansky and Dittman. Um, but for statistical mechanics, uh, I would highly recommend this book by Kittel. Now, it's kind of odd that this book is almost unknown. Uh, it's almost never, it's almost never um, um, cited anywhere, but it's, it's, it's kind of just a discovery. Dover publishes, Dover just dig up books that are out of print and they republish them at very cheap prices. And this one, they just d dug up this book by Kittel, is a really famous statistical physics guy. And this is just brilliant. It's, it's a thin book. It's a really excellent book. Um, and there are some others. Huang will be too advanced. It's very mathema mathematical in a sense. Um, Huang used to work with Yang and Li. C. N. Yang and Lee, the Nobel Prize winners, um, he he, did, he wrote papers with them, and he wrote and so his book is informed by insights that are at the highest level. The standard book, the standard book that um, everybody quotes from Kittel is Kittel and Kramer. It's the thermal physics. It's another one you can have a look at if you want. Landau and Lipschitz statistical physics is probably too high a level. Landau and Lipschitz, uh, these books in general, uh, are, are difficult to read um, because, uh, uh, partly because uh, the Russian way of doing physics and Russian way of thinking, really, Eastern European Russian, um, is, really complete, is really very different to uh, what, what is standard in the West. Um, it's... Um, it's, um, it, it, it sounds like they're, they're waffling on, but in fact they're digging deeper and deeper into profound principles. Uh, their view is uh, from a phenomenological view as well. There's a detailed syllabus of what we do in the, what we're going to do in each lecture. If you want to prepare for the next lecture, then all you have to do is read what's in the syllabus for the next lecture and uh, and all of it is from Callan. All of this is from Callan. We don't do anything about heat engines in thermodynamics. Um, we will derive the maximum work theorem without any heat engines and can't can no efficiency without the use of heat engines. And we look at, uh, really, you'll see that it's a geometrical theory. The, the assignments, uh, sorry, the, the, the tutorials are uh, here. It's just the, um, in between each of the quantum mechanics tutorials. So next week, you've got this physical physics tutorial with Professor Yamakage of SLAB. School of Physics, S-Lab is uh, my lab. Right. And he knows school physics and thermodynamics really well. And, and Professor Aida knows quantum mechanics really well. And so these guys are really good at, um, in the field. Okay.
So let's just get on with it. There's, there's quite a bit to cover today. Um, first of all, I'd just like to have a look at this quote from Einstein. And the deep, and I'll just uh, read it from here. Therefore, the deep impression that classical thermodynamics made upon me, um, okay, it is the only physical theory of universal content which I am convinced will never be overthrown within the framework of applicability of its basic concepts. So there's something about thermodynamics uh, which it, 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 somehow it captures physical systems. And no matter which new theories have come up, you know, thermodynamics was, was uh, first developed in, in the 1800s. It was the, uh, the, one of the main reasons why the Industrial Revolution uh, occurred in Europe and was given impetus uh, because, uh, the, because uh, people were able to design steam engines that were more and more efficient. Um, by understanding thermodynamic <coughs> concepts. Um, yet, even uh, in, uh, after the advent of quantum mechanics, that nothing needs to be changed in, in thermodynamics. Well, statistical mechanics, it, it is sometimes argued, is a more fundamental theory, and many people believe that. Um, personally, I'm not convinced. I, I think that there are aspects of thermodynamics that, uh, that are not derivable from statistical mechanics. Um, that's based on the work of a professor who was at the University of Western Australia for many years, Professor Michael Buckingham, who, will, who you will see um, cited in many books on thermodynamics and statistical mechanics. He came up with a very famous uh, theory of helium near the, what's called the Lambda transition. Well, he, he worked out the thermodynamics of it. But he also worked on manifolds that, um, in thermodynamic systems. Anyway. So, outline of today, And it, let's, uh, we're going to look at some mathematical preliminaries. It is a geometrical theory, so we need some, some, a couple of basic facts about uh, functions of many variables. Uh, we'll continue these basic facts in the third lecture. We'll just introduce what we need today. We also, I want to just give you an impression um, of how thermodynamics is used. If you can get this, then it can avoid a lot of trouble later on. What tends to happen when you solve thermodynamic problems is that you end up going around in circles. <coughs> See, because what happens is that <coughs> an experiment is done in a particular set of variables, a particular set of variables that are under control, <coughs> but um, you, you might, it might be more convenient to express it uh, in terms of in, express all the quantities in terms of other variables. And you've got to be clear in your mind in which direction you're going in a sense of changing the variables um, and what exactly is unknown and what equations you need. And if you're not, then you end up changing the variables and trying to change the variables again. You start chasing your tail, you go around in circles. So part of the vision of this way of teaching thermodynamics is to give you a picture <coughs> of, uh, uh, that, that when you're solving thermodynamic problems, you have a clear idea of how to move forward rather than going around in circles. Now, you'll see what I mean um, you know, in, in, a couple of, in a couple of weeks when you start actually solving some problems. Okay. Right. Um, just some revision of some basic concepts. Now, this is just first year level. Now the G30 students here are the first students uh, who did not sit my fundamental physics um, thermodynamics course. I, I used to teach fundamental physics in FP2. I used to teach thermodynamics, and um, I'm just this is just straight from that course. Uh, and also before I came here at the University of Western Australia, I taught thermodynamics for about seven or eight years in uh, first year, so, and, and basically it's the same courses I taught here in first year. 
So this is from that. <clears throat> Just some basic concepts. So here is um, a little bit of mathematics. A little bit of mathematics. Here is a bit of very basic physics and a bit of some concepts, which you really need to grasp. Okay. And now we're getting into the new stuff here. Um, I proved the existence of the of a function which we call the internal energy function. Here with the symbol U. Um, and the, the, you need a physical the physical experiment that makes it possible is Joule's experiment. I'll talk about the thermodynamic definition of heat, the first law of thermodynamics, which is essentially conservation of energy. And here I will prove the existence of, an, of a function of state, which we call entropy. It's a kind of, once, once, you, uh, once you establish the existence of an energy function, then the existence of the entropy function follows with one more principle. Um, and finally, and really uh, for the purposes of the assignment and for the next few weeks, um, in terms of calculations, the most important part of the lecture is the last part, um, postulates of equilibrium thermodynamics and the basic problem um, of thermodynamics. Okay. So all of this is important uh, as background material and, and some as you, you just need to be aware of, but what's actually the most important as far as moving on to the next lecture and next few lectures is the last part here. And also the first part, as, you, as you'll see. Right. And as I said, the main point of this lecture um, is uh, the last part of Calvin Chapter 1. And um, so it's the last part of this, uh, this book here, in Chapter 1. Okay? So when you come to read it, if you want to read about it more fully, uh, read, read um, you get it from Calvin. Okay. So... So let's have a look at some mathematical preliminaries and let's just see how uh, um, thermodynamics is used. Well, first of all, uh, thermodynamics uses the language of differential calculus. So you will see uh, things like dp, dv, dt all over the place. And uh, what the differential means is that the change is small, but it's not too small. If, if it was too small, then something like dv would be smaller than a Planck length, or smaller than uh, uh, an atom, or smaller than a nucleus, which, which is complete nonsense uh, as far as uh, macroscopic uh, objects are concerned. So, as is typical, I guess, in physics, uh, the, uh, this differential uh, is, uh, is meant to be small, but not too small. So, what does too small mean? You know, actually, the differential, the dv, could, be, could actually be very large. It depends on, on uh, many factors, such as the rate at which information travels in the system. If the rate uh, is, if the speed of the process is very slow compared to um, the rate at which information travels in the system, then, and if, um, and if the system is very large on the scale of a galaxy, then dv can be huge. Okay. Um, so it all depends on uh, the context. If you want to know, if you want to have more precise, um, or, you know, a little bit, look, if you want to read more about that, just have a look at um, Zemansky and Bittman on page 33, which is part of the handout that I, that I gave you. It's just general background, and you don't have to uh, spend too much time on it. Now, the equation of state, now, let me just, uh, as an example, just to remind you, uh, well, the let's take the equation of state of an ideal gas, PV equals nRT. So this is the pressure, this is the volume of a sample, this is the number of moles. Um, this is uh, the gas constant, and this is the temperature. And now, depending on the variables that you control in the laboratory, we can consider any one of these, P, V, N, or T, to be functions of all the others. Right? So if temperature, volume, and number of moles is controlled in the laboratory, then pressure is a function of these three. And you would write the, the equation of state as P is NRT over V. Okay? Or I could control temperature, pressure, and number of moles in the laboratory. Okay? 
or, or volume pressure number of moles. So, um, so the, really one of the things that makes thermodynamics tricky or um, yeah, a little bit tricky is that uh, depending on which variables you control, the equations look completely different. Now, the thing is that if you control T, V, and N, that means in your apparatus, you set the temperature, you set the volume, you set the number of moles, and then you cannot set the pressure. The pressure is set by nature. Right? If you try to set the pressure, you, 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 uh, and if you try to set all four of them, you are over-determining the system. There could well be no solution. Okay? you might be trying to make force an impossible situation. So you can only control three out of four, and the last one is set by nature. Um, in general, we could write something like PV over NRT equals one. So you see an implicit function in, in the form of an implicit function. PV or NRT equals one. Um, which tells us that that um, if we if we write this is some function of v p t n equals one, this tells us that out of these four variables, three of them, only three of them are independent. Okay, right. Um, just as a side note. Uh, later on, we'll see, like in the next few weeks and months, we'll see that even um, the way you write the equation of state can convey meaning, can convey the, uh, the uh, framework, if you like, that you're working in. If I write T equals PV over NR, this is, this is within the energy representation where the temperature is an intensive variable. So something called an intensive variable, which will Define a bit later. But in the entropy representation, um, I might write P on T as the intensive variable. Right? So, and, 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 and so the equations look different. Now, if I write it like this, I am explicitly conveying the fact that um, this is my intensive variable. And so I'm actually giving the reader to give more information. Obviously, the um, like physically, if you like, the amount of content in these two equations and the one we had before is exactly the same. It's just that uh, within certain frameworks that you may be working in, um, this makes this actually makes sense. All right, so now let's have a look at some multivariable calculus, and I, I guess it's um, either a revision of what you did in MP2, or it's just um, just an easy an e easy extension of it. Well, since um, pressure, volume, and temperature can separately be considered as, as multivariable functions, <coughs> we can ask how much, let's say, um, if we choose the pressure, how much the pressure changes, if any, of T, V, or N change by a small amount. So just for, the, just for now, let's put, uh, let's say that in our experimental apparatus, the number of moles is constant. So the, the, the experimental apparatus is impermeable. And let's consider, uh, uh, let's consider the volume as a function of temperature and pressure. So calculus tells us that if you have volume as a function of te temperature and pressure, then um, a small change in volume uh, can be decomposed into uh, an amount of uh, change in the direction of um, in the direction of the pressure if the temperature changes, plus a differential amount of change um, in the direction of the temperature um, once the um, uh, for a differential change in pressure. dV where dV by dt is the slope of the v volume function in the direction of the pressure. If you uh, if you just need a bit of revision of what a partial derivative means, a partial derivative is essentially the slope in some particular direction. So for example, here, this, this here is, a, is the function f of xy, 
The point here is a point in three-dimensional space. It's, I mean, I'm in the maximum point here. A, B, F of A and B. It's a point in three-dimensional space because this is the graph of the function. Now, the derivative, partial derivative, for example, df by dy at that point, there it is there, the slope is horizontal, this is the directional derivative. It's a derivative, it's the slope of this function in the direction of the y-axis at that point. It's a slope at that point in the direction of the y-axis. Okay? And this here is the slope at that point in the direction of the x-axis. I could uh, have the, I could have the direction in any, I could have the slope in any direction by calculating the gradient of the volume and dotting it with the uh, and, and taking the dot product with the with the direction in which I want the, the, the slope. Okay, where in this case the gradient is d by dt to pair d by dt to d by dp. Yeah. Uh, why don't you specify the pressure itself? Ah, yes. In thermodynamics, um, it's in fact in any even in uh, in, in mathematics, if you have uh, a, a, a surface uh, which is which which can be written in terms of uh, any set of um, any set of variables and change, changing variables, then you would specify which which. Uh, um, variable is being kept constant. So this P here is means that the pressure is held constant, P. So for example, in, in, the, uh, in the typical thermodynamic notation, so for example, this df by dy will be the, the partial root of df by dy at constant x. Okay, so there's an x is constant, and you're um, and um, you're looking at the slope in the direction of y, the, of the y-axis. So, for example, here is um, down here is another function f of x y, and here is the x-axis, here is the y-axis, and here along this along this line, if we restrict the function, this this red line here. Just, let me just zoom in. That red line there is f of one y, and now that's just a function of one variable. So that's just a function of one variable there, and then we can ask at any point um, one uh, y hat, every, any particular okay, y naught, any particular point one y naught. What is the slope of a function along this along this line? That would be df by dy at constant x, evaluated at um, one y naught. Oops. Yeah, that would be that. Okay, df by dy at constant x, evaluated at one y naught. Okay. So there. Um, right. So in thermodynamics, because the experimental variables that are held constant. I mean, well, for example, you may pick up a book and it has a property of matter such as the volume coefficient, the coefficient of expansion in terms of a function of P and T you know, in, in the book. It's got a list of um, values for the particular substance, um, but your experiment might be holding T and V constant. And you have to convert from one to the other. And so then you have to use the um, formulas from uh, multivariable calculus or differential geometry uh, to change variables from one to the other. And you have to keep track in your, in your um, derivatives, you have to keep track of what is called constant. Just to give you an example of the sort of thing, um, you, depending on what you keep constant, you can get a completely different value for the derivative. So for example, uh, here, if t, here we've got t as a function of p, v, n. Now here, if I go 
dt dt by dp at constant v and n, that's just um, v over nr. But if I go dt by dv at constant p n, that equals p over nr, and these are completely different because of the p and v there, right? Uh, it's quite easy, quite simple, quite, quite often you would get a positive value for this one and a negative value for this one. Okay? So depending on, even the same formula, depending on what you keep constant, you get different results. It's obvious because we are looking at the slope in different directions. Okay? <clears throat> right. Now, I think it's a Yeah. Convoy, did you have a question? No, I mean, just zoom out. I mean, oh, zoom out. You want me to zoom out? <coughs> Sorry? Yeah. 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 It's um, in the, you gave an example for dv. dv is equal to partial, like, on the previous page. Uh, no. The, 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 yeah, this one. So, what direction is the change in of v? This one here? Yeah. Here is, here is v of tp, and this could be t, this could be p, and um, dv by dt is this one, a constant p. And dv by dp at constant t is this one. Um, now, even though the thermodynamic differentials dt and dp do not exactly correspond to mathematical definition of differentials, I mean, it turns out that the entire machinery of multivariable differential calculus can be applied to thermodynamic functions to give the correct predictions for experiment. Um, as long as in your experiment you treat dt and dp and dv as macroscopic yet small quantities. Um, now, uh, just as an example of this, me this uh, um, me uh, machinery of multivariable calculus, now let's have a look at two, in fact, uh, three particular properties of matter. Um, there's alpha which is defined as one of the volume dv by dt at constant p. This is called the coefficient of volume expansion. There's beta, uh, which is defined as minus v dp by dv at constant t, dp by dv at constant t. That's the isothermal bulk modulus, so isothermal because the temperature is not constant. This, this is the isobaric, but no one calls it isobaric coefficient of volume expansion. And in fact, um, in fact, these two uh, imply. Oh yeah, yeah. This one implies kappa, which is defined as one over beta. So it's minus one over v dv by dp at constant t. We use this one and this one. Uh, uh, Zamansky and Dittman use that. What's but we use these two. Uh, professor. Yeah. But for alpha, what about uh, n, the variable n? Um, uh, we we would. Uh, no, we would um, normally write that this is in a um, in a context where the number of moles is not constant. So the coefficient of volume expansion um, you would be in the, it would be in the context of of uh, impermeable container. Generally, not always, but generally. Otherwise, you do have to take it into account, and you have to figure figure out what to do. And we in lecture eight. You'll find out how to do that using Maxwell's relations. Now, once you find alpha and kappa for a material, now you, the alpha and kappa for a material, um, uh, you know, the experiments that anyone can do in the laboratory, there's probably some very well controlled um, experiments, maybe in France, maybe in NIST in the United States or something. They, and then they list, they, they make a table of variables or, the, um, or you know, set, um, there, there, are, there are books, the CRC handbook you can buy um, or get out of the library. It's got 
uh, tables of, uh, of this. Obviously, you can um, get the function programmed in software as well. Uh, but once you get alpha and kappa for, for a material in an experiment, um, you know, the thing is that this is a constant pressure. Uh, say this is uh, volume as a function of temperature and pressure in this experiment. This alpha volume is a function of temperature and pressure in the definition. Here you can tell volume is a function of temperature and pressure. Um, here, whereas here you got pressure, or here you got volume as a function of pressure and temperature, which is the same as that. Okay, volume is a function of pressure and temperature. So the way uh, in experiments, uh, the most direct way of measuring these in experiment is an experiment where you have volume as a function of temperature and pressure for both of these, and with number of moles of constant. Um, but in your experiment, you might change the temperature and volume, and then you can use the measurements predicted in, uh, for the results of the, of, the, of the standard experiments with other combinations or any combination of TV, PNN get under the control if you don't have a change of variables. So it's one of the skills you learn in thermodynamics. It's called Maxwell's relations. You learn how to change the variables to adapt to the situation that you're in, whether it's an experiment, whether it's theory. Okay? So it's, it's complicated. Yeah. All right. Um, okay. <coughs> So now we're going to work through Zemanski and Dutman section 2.4 in the handout uh, to derive some important uh, relations in multivariable calculus that you, you need all the time in, um, in thermodynamics. So that's, um, that's this here, it's on the, well, the, it's the second or third paper, the mathematical theorems. So as it says here, there are two uh, simple theorems in partial differential calculus, multivariable calculus, uh, that are used that are used very often in thermodynamics. And so just the starting point uh, is suppose we have a function of three variables x, y, and z, and suppose we put this function equal to zero. As soon as you do that, it means that only two out of these three variables can be independent. Okay. We can imagine x as a function of y and z, and if we do that, just arbitrarily say x is a function of y and z, um, then the differential dx is dx by dy at constant z dy plus dx by dz at constant y dz. Okay. Now, we can also imagine that y uh, is written as a function of x and z, and we have the equivalent uh, relationship between differentials for, for dy. Okay, so this is dy by dx at constant z, which is completely different to dx by dy at constant z. Well, or maybe they're related. We'll see. Now, we we'll substitute this dy into into uh, the, the first equation here, substitute it into there. So there is this expression here. This goes directly into there. So there you have dy by dx, constant z dx. So there's that there. That's that there. And then um, you multiply all that out. So this, this dx by dy at constant z, any particular value of y and z, this is just a number, and then any particular value of x and z, that, that, that there is just a number, you just multiply them together. So you just multiply it all out, you get this, and now from this, uh, there follows a couple of uh, very useful relations. Um, now since only two of the three coordinates are independent, I would choose, let's just arbitrarily choose x and z as independent, in fact, there they are. Um, so we can set, since they're 
independent. Being independent means that that's what we control in the experiment. Okay. So if this, if you were applying this multivariable calculus to, put, uh, to a particular experiment, the independent variables would be the variables that you control that you control the apparatus, the temperature, or the volume, or the pressure, or something. Okay. So we can uh, make sure that um, if we do any changes in x, that we do it at when z is constant. We can make sure that, for example, one of the things we can do is if we change x, we make sure that z is constant. In terms of differentials, that means dx is not equal to zero, but dz is zero. Okay? So now what does that imply for this relation here? So dz is zero, that means this term doesn't contribute, but um, dx equals that product times dx, which means that that product equals, so then we have, let me write it out, so <coughs> dx not equal to zero and dz equals zero, both of these imply just, that means that term drops out because dz is zero, sorry. That dz is zero, that goes, and we have dx is dx by dy at constant z, dy by dx at constant z, dx, and that's true no matter how big dx is. dx uh, can, can, you know, dx can be um, the, the difference in temperature between your starting point and your finishing point. You might control the temperature difference. It might be, since we're writing it as a differential, that means that in that particular system, the, the change in temperature, even if it's 20 degrees Celsius or 20 degrees Kelvin, it, it's small in that system. It's it's, it happens to be small in that system. It could, you might have to be a micro Kelvin to be considered small. You might have to be one Kelvin to be considered small, or maybe a million Kelvin to be considered small, a neutron star. It, whatever it is, it's considered small. But dx can have, uh, we can change uh, the temperature by any amount in that small region and keep it small. You get that? So dx can have many values. Right. So that means that, um, that uh, since this equation is true for arbitrary dx, it means that 1 equals dx by dy dz dy by dx at constant z. Oh, there's something wrong. No, that's right, that's right, at constant z is correct. Uh, see, I did not say, oh, dx cancels out. I did not say that, right? That's like, that's just colloquial, okay? That implies that. You don't have to say anything about dx canceling. Yeah? So that's just the normal two-dimensional case, as in uh, yeah. just the gradient and the inverse will be. So, yeah, so that means that um, dx by dy at constant z equals 1 over dy by dx at constant z, which is what you are familiar with because your intuition is from single variable calculus. Okay? But in multivariable calculus, your intuition will lead you astray, as you'll see right now. Let's have a look. So that's that one. And the very next one, um, now back back to this equation here. Let's say that this time dx equals zero and dz not equal to zero. Oops. Then um, if dx is zero, then this term does not contribute, but dz is not equal to zero, but dx and dz are independent. So that means, and, and yet this has to be equal, that is equal to that, in this case. Um, dz and dx are independent, but the only way this can be an equality is if this thing in the square brackets equals zero. So then we have dx by dy at constant z, dy, dy by dz at constant x, plus that equals zero, and I'll just put this on the other side, minus dx by dz at constant y, okay? So just, okay? 
So that there equals zero. So I've just written, I just took that term onto that side. And now we use what we just, um, uh, and, and now that implies from what we just worked out, dx by dy at constant z, dy by dz at constant x, um, 1 over dx by dz at constant y equals minus 1. But by what we just discovered, or what we just showed, um, that term there gives us dx by dy at constant z, dy by dz at constant x, dz by dx at constant y equals minus 1. Okay. So if you, from, from your, so in chain rule, in single variable calculus in chain rule, you get uh, something like um, uh, dx by dy, dy by dz um, equals dx by dz. Um, and then that means that dx by dy, dy by dz, dz by dx equals one. This is a, this is a single variable calculus in, in chain rule. But in multivariable calculus, it's not true. It's minus one. And it's, if you think about it, it's fairly obvious because it's, this is saying that suppose um, x, e, x has increased a bit. Let's suppose y has increased a bit. Now that mean, that forces z because this whole thing has to equal zero. That forces z to decrease. So the direction of the change, if you like, of the of the last variable has to be down less if these first to increase. Right? So because of because we have this constraint, this implicit function constraint, uh, it changes. Uh, the, the relationship that we used to the chain rule in, in single variable calculus. Okay, so we've just derived two theorems. Oh, yeah. When we when we flip the from one side to the other, yeah. We assume that the x by d z is is equal to uh, is equal to the inverse uh, of d z by d x. But we didn't. Did we just showed it. But that was for constant dz, uh, constant z, which is dz is equal to zero. And here we did not assume that dy is equal to zero. This was, yeah, so basically, yeah, let me, let me explain what you just said is trivial. It's trivial because what we derived was, was this relation, dx by dy constant z. We, we derived this using z equals zero. But I could easily, e equally well, derive the equivalent expression for dy equals zero. Perhaps, well, you need to have a dy there and a dz there. But we never stated that y is constant. Oh. This, this implies three other, two other relationships are the same. But professor, is this expression only correct when z is constant? This one there, yes. So how can it imply uh, the other two? Oh, because this is what I just said. Why is constant? This is a different because because this if I if I if I get the equivalent uh, equation here with I could have dy here and <coughs> dx dz. Oh, not dy. Um, dy here, dy dz. Or I could have dz dx uh, dz dz. Dx, dz, dx, dy. I could have many permutations here. I could, I could do this. I could redo this in how many different ways? Three, two, uh, what is it? Um, two times. There'd be two, uh, three choose two, at least three. 
Uh, three, I reckon six. Six. I would have six different relationships here. I could, I could, I could redo this, and then you'll see that this is true. Yes. Only provided that uh, f of x, y, z is equal to zero. Yes. So suppose that it's not equal to zero, then if it's equal to one, it should make no difference. But if it's equal to something else, then function. Then That's you can rewrite that in terms of another function of x, y, z equal to zero. Yeah. Now, getting back to physics, so what we just did was this uh, general fact from uh, multivariable calculus. Getting back to physics, we talked about PV and T. So for PV and T, we have this relationship, dP by dV at constant T, dV by dT at constant P is minus dP by dT at constant V. Okay? Um, but the thing is that dP by dV at constant T is almost kappa or beta, depending on what you want to put better. And dV by dT at constant P is almost isothermal compressibility. In fact, if you check the <laughs> definitions, kappa is minus 1 on V dV by dP at constant T. Um, so therefore, it's pretty obvious you can have a look at it for yourself later, that um, very clear that dp by dt at constant v, there's dp by dt at constant v, the minus sign comes over here, divide through by one on, by, by, multiply by v there, divide by one on v there, um, you get beta divided by kappa. Okay? And so, the, so this is now a general fact. You've just discovered a relationship between properties of matter beta and kappa, and an experiment that you can do. You can change the temperature at constant volume, so just lock the, uh, lock the material in a, in a rigid container, increase the temperature by a small amount, and measure the pressure, and that's guaranteed to be the ratio of these two numbers that you get from um, a table somewhere. Yeah. So, and this is just now based on a fact from multivariable calculus, and yet it's a relationship between <coughs> properties of matter. Okay. Um, if the pressure is a function of temperature and volume, in fact, in fact, um, this um, oops, this uh, this here says that you're taking derivative. Uh, the pressure with respect to the temperature with the volume constant. Here, this is saying that the pressure is a function of the temperature and volume. So, if that is so, then uh, the relationship between differentials is now dP by dt constant V dt plus dP by dV constant T dV. And that, as we just saw, is beta on kappa. And in fact, um, dP by dV is um, minus 1 on kappa V. Okay, so in fact, now this different this equation of differentials can be expressed in terms of properties of matter. Now, if the volume is constant, let's say dV is zero, then you just have um, dP is beta on kappa dt. So you get that. And so in your particular experiment, you have the substance and you're controlling the temperature within a, in a rigid container. And you want to know by how much the pressure changes if you change the temperature. Now, as long as, as, long as um, uh, this function here, beta on kappa, doesn't change much with the, with, in your temperature range, you can treat it as a constant. You see, what that math means mathematically is that you are ignoring higher derivatives of, of P here. It's a Taylor expansion. Okay? You're just looking at the first term. So, so you're ignoring the high derivatives because you're allowed to. So we're saying that you're in a you're, you're saying that you're in a temperature range where the where beta and kappa doesn't change much. Right, so there's beta and kappa. Um, so you cause the temperature to change by heating it a bit or doing whatever. No, it has to be at constant volume, so it has to be heat. Um, and then the pressure is going to change, and by how much does it change? You do an integral. Okay? You integrate the function beta and kappa, 
uh, with respect to the temperature, uh, between the temperature range, and that will give you the change in pressure due to the peak. Yeah. Um, if, uh, if beta of kappa is, uh, is approximately constant, um, then it's close enough to a constant in the temperature range, then that obviously um, can be written like this. You just have the delta T there, the beta of kappa evaluated at the initial temperature. Okay? Doesn't matter, it's constant evaluated in any of the temperatures. Okay? Alright. So that's um, that's the main that's that's the that's the introduction point that I wanted to make. The really great thing about Zemanski and Dittman is that it gives you many, many examples of thermodynamic systems and first laws of thermodynamics, the second laws of thermodynamics, stretch wire, um, surfaces, electrochemical cell, that's a battery, what we call a battery, um, dielectric slab, blah, 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 parametric. You know, we don't, obviously we don't need all that, of course, but you may be interested uh, to see the variety of situations in which thermodynamics is applicable and the equations are always the same. Okay, so the next stage in the lecture is I want to just revise some of the basic concepts. Um, first of all, say what is thermodynamics? I already told you what thermodynamics is. It's a geometric theory that encodes properties of matter in the slopes and curvatures of a surface or manifold. Okay, but um, sort of more um, practically, it's a science that connects heat and work and develops the consequences of conservation of energy and the behavior of energy, this one here, the behavior of energy when restrictions are placed on or removed from a system. This is called entropy. Right? Entropy is the behavior of the energy. It's how energy spreads out when you, leave, when you, um, when you remove restrictions from some experimental system. You allow energy to flow. Once the energy flows out, you can't get it back in without help. And that's the basically the second law of thermodynamics. Based on experiment and geometry. Um, it's a completely external view. External in a sense that you do not ask any questions about the properties of the underlying constituents meaning atoms, molecules, um, phonons, um, skirmions, anything. You don't care what makes up the system. You just ask what is the behavior of the system as a whole. It's completely general. So gases of solid metal, or liquid metal, or rubber band, or gases of sound waves. Gases of sound waves, okay, which are called phonons. Gases of sound waves in a superfluid right, are all described by the same equations. Uh, some substances are thermodynamically useful, and what makes them useful. Um, there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between the heat input and its length or volume or resistance, etc. Second thing, it's repeatable. But there are always limits. You can't put in, uh, you, there are always limits to, where, to in, within which this theory is applicable. You can't put in too much heat, and there's always a point where the substance stops behaving nicely. Um, okay. Experience shows that pure heating processes and pure working processes exist. These are just different ways of adding energy to a substance. Once transferred to the substance, energy does not remember how it got there. You get the energy out again by a pure heat or pure work process or mixed process. Heat is transferred into a substance by a flame or a hot plate or something. Work is done on a substance by compressing it or stretching it or changing the external magnetic field. So the energy in a substance got there via some heat input, 
within it in its entire history and mechanical work done on it, assuming a constant number of particles, because otherwise you can also change its energy by changing the number of particles. Uh, we want a connection between these modes of energy input Q and W and the total energy, especially for a single process. This energy is available for future heating or work or mixed processes. However, we must first agree on how we supply heat or do work. Why? Well, the amount of heat tra energy transferred will be different depending on how you carry out the process. Uh, no, one way it can be different is the following. The rate of heating or expansion will affect the heat absorbed for work done, even assuming it, that friction is eliminated. That's because fast heating causes currents, um, various imbalances, uh, um, whirlpools in a, in a liquid or um, superfluid or gas, so that heat will not be evenly distributed. So rapid heat transfer of some amount Q, on the other hand, yeah, well, yeah, will, will cause a larger increase in entropy than a slow, carefully controlled transfer, in which both bodies are internally as still as possible. The most efficient, in some sense, transfer of heat happens when everything is done so slowly that uh, the system is somehow still, in some, some sense, still as possible, as still as possible inside. So we want to uh, define a standard, possibly idealized process uh, that will tell us the maximum possible work we can get out, so there's no waste. So, uh, in order to define this type of process, uh, first of all, we need to define the idea of equilibrium, and this is the thermodynamic idea. So this thing here is meant to uh, is meant to represent an isolated system. So this is an isolated system. Uh, isolated means that the external universe cannot do work on it, which that means that the walls are completely rigid. Okay. Um, the the walls are insulated, so no particles uh, escape. And it, oh, so that's uh, impermeable, impermeable, so no particles escape. Uh, and it's insulated so that no heat gets in or out. Heat uh, being, well, if we move outside of thermodynamics and think of the microscopic view, heat is, is random motion of molecules. Um, random meaning uh, in any direction. It's energy that is contained in random motion, and it's completely random motion, not motion that tends to be in one direction, such as a wave. So thermal equilibrium is this. Um, thermal equilibrium, get a, get a thermometer, and first of all, suppose you divide up your system into many small boxes, and you put a thermometer into every single uh, one at a time, or you've got enough thermometers in every every little box, and you let the thermometer reading settle down, and eventually you notice that all your thermometers read the same temperature. So, what that means is that the entire system, every point of the entire system, is at the same temperature. Now, I cannot obviously I cannot make these boxes too small. Otherwise, the atomic nature or molecular nature of the substance will become visible. In thermodynamics, we're interested in the, uh, the limit in which um, the microscopic um, constituents uh, do not make their appearance. And so you have to have enough particles. It's called the thermodynamic limit. Okay. Um, what about mechanical equilibrium? Mechanical equilibrium means that uh, that the pressure, not only is the temperature the same in every single uh, one of these little boxes, but the pressure is the same. So if we've got a, a pressure gauge, and put it into, or enough pressure gauges, we put the pressure gauges into all these little boxes, you, each pressure gauge would read the same thing. And what that means is that um, if, if, we, if that was not the case, 
then, for example, we have this region here at a, at a higher pressure than, say, all the rest. And that would mean that if we put in a wall, let's, let's say this region, for argument's sake, if we put a wall in here that was able to move without letting particles going past um, on the outside, then that, that partition would move, would be forced that way, if this pressure was higher, would be forced that way, and this part of the system would do work on that part of the system. That is not an equilibrium situation. What we want is mechanical equilibrium where no part of the system is doing work on the other parts of the system. That's an idealization, of course, uh, because re in reality, um, if you look at these boxes and they're small enough, then you will have fluctuations in the number of particles, you have fluctuations in the local pressure, and you will have locally, um, at a very small scale, um, locally the system will be doing work in its surround the subsystem will be doing work in its surroundings. But we're talking about subsystems which are large enough where that's invisible. Right? So mechanical equilibrium is the pressure and temperature is the same everywhere. In that case, when you, you are in thermal equilibrium and mechanical equilibrium, then the temperature is constant in every part of the the temperature is constant in the system and it's the same in every part. The pressure is constant and it's also the same in every part. So that means that T and P, and because by definition this is a rigid box, V, these variables are well defined in the thermodynamic sense. These are now thermodynamic variables, P, T, V, and they are well defined. Okay? So thermodynamic variables are only well defined in equilibrium. There are, okay, this is the starting point. Obviously, in fluid mechanics and that, you, you learn um, local pressure, local temperature, local, local volume, all this. But you start here. P, T, and V are also called state variables. Now, a state diagram or phase diagram. The state diagram is a graph of uh, one thermodynamic variable versus another one. Pick any pair, right? So it's a two-dimensional graph. In fact, you can have three-dimensional graphs. Okay. P is a function of V and T, for example. Okay. So P, T, and V can also be called coordinates. Okay. Um, now, here's a very important point. And unfortunately, um, a lot of textbooks, certainly not current, but a lot of textbooks, even the first year textbook in one of the uh, problems, Risley Helen Walker, in one of the problems at the end, um, does not, uh, breaks this rule. And that is that a point is drawn on a state diagram only if the system is in thermal and mechanical equilibrium. Only if, because only then it makes sense. So for example, in a system in equilibrium, I can at, at, at temperature at pressure P naught and volume V naught and obviously some temperature T naught. I can draw this point here on that diagram because P and V and T are well defined. They I do not change. They are not fluctuating. Yeah. Doesn't it depend on time? No. Um, Equilibrium is time independent. It's the state of the material or substance uh, that is that, in principle, is there forever. But can't we plot the point for a given time? Like, say, at P is equal to zero, P is this. No. Um, after all, after you have uh, changed the conditions of the apparatus in the laboratory, there's a big mess inside, whirlpools and waves and stuff. All of that settles down. After it's settled down that's when you can draw that point. If, okay, that's when you draw that point there. Now, suppose I want to get to another point. Suppose we want to change, we want a way of changing P, V, and T in a carefully controlled way so that we do not make whirlpools and, um, and um, 
inefficiencies. We want to make the inside, we want to make the system and every part of the system as still as possible. So we want um, a way of changing PBNT in a carefully controlled way where the system is always in equilibrium. The system is always in equilibrium. This is an idealized process first discovered, first in, um, talked about by Carnot at 1826, 1827. Nobody believed him, nobody, everybody ignored him until 1851, 1852. And he died when he was about 30 or something. But, yeah. but why do we wait? For because, because otherwise the term of the name girl was not defined. But why are they defined for an instant? Like, is it just by definition or because um, in principle you could define P, V and T for a given time and then plot it with time? Sure. I guess different parts of the system could have different values. You know? Which part do you think? Average that out for a given portion at a given time. That would yeah, but then it will be different still. It, it, the, the average will be will be fluctuating. Yeah, yeah. It's but a random variable. Yeah, but you still want to get you want to what you want is is you want the state of the system where nothing is changing. Oh, okay. But, but that, that's what we want. Yeah. So, so that's why. Yeah. That's equilibrium thermodynamics. Okay. Otherwise, it's non equilibrium thermodynamics. So, for example, if we want to get from V0 to uh, VF there and P0 to PF, let's say, um, and, and no, if we do it quickly, we could we could re we could rearrange our apparatus and do it quickly, and 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 then we we lock in the final conditions, and after a, after a while it'll all settle down, and after it settles down we can draw that point. But in between, if we did it quickly, it's a mess inside, and you do not have a unique value of pressure. Or temperature. You do locally, you're going to have variations, big waves and things. But if we do it very slowly, such that in this idealized process that Carnot had thought of, then we can actually plot the process on the on the state diagram. It has to have the direction as well. We plot the process. This here means a quasi-static process. Quasi-static, static means unchanging. Quasi means not truly unchanging because it's, it is changing, look. But it's changing so slowly that it looks like it's not changing. So it's quasi-static. So the system goes in this idealized process, the system goes from VI to VF. It's always in equilibrium. Uh, we draw a continuous line on the state diagram. The process is extremely slow. In fact, it's infinitely slow. Um, it, would, it would take a very long time, or maybe an infinitely long time, for the quasi-static process. Right. So this is just some basic revision of first year material, uh, I don't think you did it in your first year course, but anyway, there it is. Okay. So, next thing, existence of an internal energy function U, function of state. First of all, uh, we define U by this is the idea. We define this function u by describing how to measure it. So it's it's the basically it's a basic like a, it's all in, um, inspired by experiment, very closely related to experiment. And we only use adiabatic processes. Does anyone remember what adiabatic means? No transfer of heat. No transfer of heat. So adiabatic processes are the fundamental like, building blocks, if you like, of the entire theory. Alright, so we know that applying a candle to a gas sample 
has the same effect as compressing it. So you do it. If you compress a bike pump really quickly, do it. Uh, well, well, it can be friction of the, uh, of the of the pump end, whatever you call it, with the with the with the wall. But I suppose it's really well oiled. Even then, you would actually heat up the air inside. Right? So compressing would heat up the air. But you can also heat up the so a mechanical mechanical work heats up the air. Um, but also you can heat up the air by putting a candle heating it up. Okay? So two different forms of energy have the same effect. Also, if you leave a mixture, so another example of the same thing. <coughs> if you leave a mixture, oh, perhaps it's a different thing. Leaving a mixture of water and ice out in the sunlight, what happens in the end? The ice melts. Has the same effect as vigorously stirring the mixture for long enough. So one, you're actually doing some mecha something mechanical. The other one, you're just nothing mechanical. You're just having a cup of coffee and something else is giving you, give, putting in the, the energy. Another observational effect, uh, uh, so these two are in fact slightly different for a very important reason. We'll see it in a minute. And then the last fact is, um, observational fact, is that there exist walls such that the ice water mixture never seems to melt. Okay, so uh, put it in a thermos flask, that's, that's uh, good enough, and you put that out in the sun, nothing happens. So, conclusion, first of all, there exist two forms of energy, heat and mechanical work, which seem to have the same effect on the, um, um, in fact, there's a third conclusion, which, will, which we need Jules' experiment for, but anyway. Second, certain kinds of walls block a heat transfer. So, the walls of a thermos flask. Now, these are called adiabatic walls. Adiabatic walls block heat transfer. Any work processes that occur within such walls are called adiabatic processes. Okay. Now, Joule's experiment. Joule's experiment was, I um, um, think, don't know how long it took him, it's around 1843 to 1845. It's, it's important for many reasons, <coughs> for three reasons, but I'll only mention one or two of them. Joule's experiment showed that mechanical energy and heat energy are really just two forms of the same thing. It also introduces a different type of adiabatic mechanical work processes, process. And that we use in the, um, in the, in the proof of the existence of you. So what was his experiment? So, he tried to get as good an adiabatic um, container as he could. I think this was made of wood, this thing here. This thing is a thermometer. Um, this thing is an axle, and on the axle there are paddles. This, and this is a, a rope that's um, tied, tied around, or, uh, wound around this, uh, what do you call it? Is it a spindle? I'm not sure. Anyway, one of those. And that, there's a pulley and there's a weight here, a mass. What happened is that um, he would um, allow the mass to drop. This is purely mechanical energy. Gravitational, gravity is doing work on the mass. It's causing a change in uh, energy. Um, potential energy gets converted to kinetic energy. But actually, as it's coming down, it's actually rotating the paddle, and he found that the temperature would increase. So, um, so mechanical energy is converted into heat energy. Right. In fact, this blew away another theory that heat was a substance that flowed from hot things to cold things. The whole language of thermodynamics is still, in terms of what Carno, the language that Carnot used in those days, that heat flowed 
from hot to cold that is of a substance. But heat can't be a substance here because there's only a rope connecting uh, the mass here with um, the paddle here. So he blew away that theory and he also found that mechanical energy is equivalent to heat energy. There's one other thing. There's one other thing, aspect of this, that if you somehow lifted, if you could somehow lift this uh, weight back up and make the paddle go around in the other direction, you would not take the heat out of the water and it, you cannot get the heat to go out of the water and to lift up the, the, the weight to go back up. It won't happen. So you can't make the paddles spin the other way by themselves. You have to, you cannot convert that amount of heat to the same amount of mechanical work, the same amount of work by making, making the paddle go backwards. So this is also an irreversible process. So he discovered this irreversible process. So there are really three uh, aspects to this experiment. One is kind of philosophical, but two are completely relevant to modern physics. Okay. Right, so, um, so now what you do is I'm going to say you start off with a state diagram. Uh, let's start to zoom out. State diagram. Um, some pair of thermodynamic variables here. And let's say you start at, at A. And let's, let's say I'll give you, um, let's say this is P and uh, P and um, V, let's say we're talking about a gas or some sort of fluid. Let's see what, um, what did it all? So, let's see the last, uh, let's see what um, Calvin did. It is pressure and volume. Pressure and volume. So, pressure and volume, it is. Start off the state diagram of pressure and volume. And any two points, A and B, let's say B is there and A is there. All right, so what you do, you start off at A, um, put the substance inside uh, a thermos flask or an insulating, uh, insulating apparatus, do work on it. So this is an adiabatic process. So it's a special process, adiabatic, and do it extremely slowly so it's quasi static so we can draw the process and it, let's say it goes something like this like this what we do is go to the volume at that at which b is the state the, the target state b go to that volume okay so this is increasing the volume quasi statically Stand that way and now you put a paddle wheel inside the substance, and you and you and you stir it rigorous, vigorously at constant volume in an irreversible process. So I'll draw I'll I'll, I'll draw dots here. It's not really a you can't draw it there. But you end up at B. Yeah. So right. So, in this leg here, I know the change in the volume, I've measured the pressure and I know how much work is done. Okay. In this process here, so, so from here to here, I know how much energy is put into the system. In fact, it has to be taken out of the system, so it's negative, it doesn't matter, okay? We know what the work done is. For this one here, we know, for example, if, if the paddle wheel is driven by a falling weight, then we know how much work is done on it. Could be an electrical system, we know how much electricity has gone in, we know the resistance, we know the power dissipated. So we know how much, how much energy is put in in this leg. 
So we know the energy in this leg, we know the energy in this leg. So we know the change in energy from A to B. Okay. We know what the change in energy is. It's a, it's a specific number. Right. Now I could choose, I could cover the entire PV plane into AB pairs. And I can go either from A to B or from B to A. For any any pair, I can I can get a number. So this is let's say um, P naught V naught. Starting from here, I can tell you I can assign to any point in the plane a, a number. So what have I done? I've defined a function on the plane. That's what a function is. It, it's going to be. It's um, um, yeah. It, it's it's I've defined a function on the plane. Okay. So that function is u. It's a well-defined. I have, I have a well-defined process to assign a number to any point in this plane. So that's we call that assignment. So now this is arbitrary PV, U of PV, and there's going to be T as well, um, is the function that assigns um, to every point in the plane PVT um, a unique number. This is a map from, in this case, it's from R3 into R. It's a function. All right. And it's a well-defined way. Right. And the other thing is, it depends on your reference point, P0, B0. Okay. So along with this function in, in classical thermodynamics, or thermodynamics, I must specify relative to P0, B0, some, some reference, and T0, some reference point. Okay. If we had a different reference point, you'd have a different function, but that would be simply related. Yeah. Right. So, how, how do you know that it's an unique point? How do you know that each point has a different number associated with the function? Because if I choose any point, random point, like that one, I first do an adiabatic process until I get to the same volume, then I do the irreversible work process to get up to there. And I know the energy there, I know the energy there, so I know the energy difference there. So it's a well-defined process. But isn't every point, for example, on, on the isotherm, I think, of the same mm -hmm. Sorry? Oh, but isn't every point on the isotherm of the same U? Sorry? So it's not unique to a point? It's unique I'm not saying it's unique. Yeah. I'm saying that the, that the, the way of assigning the number to the point is what we find. That's what a function is. By the way, two points can have the same energy. Right. Although the like like, like, like an isotherm for, for an ideal gas. Yeah. Right. Okay. Um, so delta U is known, so U is known as a well defined function of the state variables relative to some reference state. The internal energy has characteristics in common with the mechanical potential energy. Okay. So the internal energy is, is uh, also called a thermodynamic potential. Because when it was discovered, um, they quickly realized that it had certain um, things in common, properties in common, or behaviors in common, with mechanical energy, mechanical potential energy. Um, it's a kind of a stored energy that can be recovered to a certain extent. Okay. You can recover the energy. But also the slope of the function, and this is something we will explore next semester in, uh, in phase transitions. The slope of the, fu of the function tells you the restoring force in a, in, in a certain sense. Our system feels if it finds itself away from equilibrium. So you, can, you do have fluctuations around the equilibrium, 
kind of an extension of thin dynamics. But, um, and the equilibrium occurs where the, this energy is minimum. Because all physical systems look for states, search for states, or try to be in states at which the energy is minimum. Now, it may find itself away from that equilibrium due to some random fluctuation. But the slope of this curve, see, because, it, because the equilibrium point is a minimum, this slope is negative, this slope is positive. This slope is negative and it tends to make the system go back that way. This slope is positive and make, tends to make the system go back that way. Just like a potential energy curve. A spring, for example, around equilibrium. This is the Chatelier's principle. We don't use this at all this semester, but it's very important in phase transition. So that's why U is called a thermodynamic potential. Now the heat flux, what is heat? Well, how is heat defined? So, so far we've defined everything in terms of adiabatic processes. So the internal energy function is defined in terms of adiabatic processes. So, the heat flux into a system, into a system, in any process, now, and we are assuming a constant number of particles, is the difference in internal energy between the initial and final states diminished by the work done in that process. So Q is defined as delta U minus W, a constant model. Okay? So that's the definition of Q. Which is really a statement of conservation of energy, saying that there are no other terms here there's no energy somehow, in fact, there's no chemical reaction that's, that releases energy, for example. And um, it's really a statement of conservation of energy. There are no mysterious energy sources or energy drains. You should note, you should remember, that different processes between processes between a particular pair of states give different combinations of Q and W, the different amount of heat transferred, different amount of work done, depending on the path you take between two different points, but the change in internal energy is always the same. That's the first law of thermodynamics. It's basically conservation of energy, it's saying yeah, conservation of energy. Uh, in a quasi-static process, in a simple in you know, a thermodynamic system, the quasi-static work, this dW is minus PdV, and it's greater than zero if the uh, amount of volume is that is less than zero. If the if the change in volume is negative, then the infinitesimal work done is positive. This D has a line through it which I'll explain in lecture three. It's called an inexact differential. Okay, uh, you can read that page for yourself. Quasi static heat. Um, again, DQ is D, uh, differential with the line um, through it, it means it's an inexact differential. Actually, I can tell you um, now, um, it just means that different paths give you different amounts of dq and dw. That's all it says. That's why it's an inexact differential. Inexact differential means that, well, we'll, we'll look at it in lecture three, but inexact differential just means that um, different, different paths between two points give different um, amounts of heat or different amounts of work. That's all that, that, that's saying. But du is a total differential, or accelerate exact differential, because the path doesn't matter. Okay. Perfect differential. Okay. Right. What's the time? It's five past. Um, I think I think we can have a we can have a little break little break for um, 10 minutes 
and then we'll, um, I'll just prove the existence of an entropy function. Oh, by the way, function of state. I should have, I should just mention the word function of state is a very important concept. What it means is that, oh, you, we'll, we'll see what it means um, after the break. Oh, I'll talk about it after the break. So after the break, I'll just prove the existence of the entropy function of state. And we'll just, I'll just, mean, I'll just um, go through the postulates of thermodynamics. The, the last part is what you need for the assignment, which I haven't handed out yet, but I'll send out um, on the weekend. I'll give you on, on Monday for people doing quantum mechanics class. Okay, so we'll have a 10 minute break. Okay, so let's uh, show the existence of another function of state. Um, really depends on uh, the fact that the internal energy function of state exists plus um, a, a, a mathematical uh, fact which we won't use, but let, let me just uh, say it this way. So, uh, it's a, this existence of this function is a consequence only of the existence of the internal energy function of state together with the fact that irreversible adiabatic processes exist. Um, the same ones that are used to define U. This, this here was discovered by a Greek mathematician called Karathiodori in 1909 and it's really uh, it's really an amazing uh, geometrical derivation but the thing is that many well because it's so enticing many physicists very famous physicists try to understand uh, physically why his mathematical um, approach worked. And no one could really uh, understand it. But people like Heisenberg uh, looked at it and it, it just it just doesn't it just seems to be obscure in terms of physics. Can't really understand. Uh, if anyone's interested I can you can email me and I can point you in in a in, a, in the direction where you can uh, read it. You can just Google it. But um, instead of using character Dory's derivation, we'll use something a little bit simpler. Um, uh, we use a weaker statement. It's Kelvin's formulation of the second law of thermodynamics. I mean, I haven't actually um, stated what the second law of thermodynamics is, but we'll get to that later. It, it, so Kelvin's formulation is the following. It is impossible for a spontaneous process, spontaneous process is one that happens by itself without any outside help. So it's impossible for a spontaneous process to extract heat from a single reservoir and perform an equal amount of work. I'll just try to think about what that means afterwards. So we'll sketch the proof of this on a thermodynamic diagram with the following axes. So on the vertical axis we have the internal energy. And all the other axes are thermodynamic variables, such as volume, <coughs> which can be changed to produce an adiabatic work process. Could be volume, so far, well, um, could be maybe uh, magnetization. Um, other, there are other variables which are more exotic than you, from systems that are more exotic than you've seen so far. But you will see many of these systems in the next 12 months. So this is not T and P. This is, these are mechanical variables, variables that can be changed to produce uh, an adiabatic work process. So what you do is you start at any point There's u, there's v, x, k. Any point, there's, there's the point v, x, k in the domain of u. And then up here, there is the point 
u of v of xk and it's v xk. So it's a, uh, it's a point in three dimensions because, well, it's actually many, many possibly many dimensions because we don't know how many of these sorts of variables there are. Yeah. Uh, you said that it the two can't be t and p. Mm. And you said because it, we want to bring a mechanical change? Uh, um, what is that? We, what we want is, um, <coughs> what, what we really want is extensive, extensive variables, which uh, I haven't mentioned. Uh, the reason for that is kind of a bit deeper. But anyway, so you've got these sorts of variables. You start here, and then, and then you enclose the system, your, your apparatus, um, uh, in, in an adiabatic container, so it doesn't let any heat in or out. And you allow it to do work, or you, or you do work on it, and you measure these variables. You, you, you do it quasi statically, so the, that's the other thing. We do it extremely slowly, so you have this idealized process, and you come out to some other point, say here. Okay. In fact, uh, and then, then you might um, try another process going out this way, you end up here. Another process, you end up here. Another process, you keep going, you end up here. And so on and so on. And you do this many, many times. In fact, many, many, many times, and you build up all the points that are reachable from this point using a quasi-static adiabatic process. And so all these points will make up a surface, a manifold, proper word again, a surface, a manifold. And this can be, this can be, um, this can have bends in it, you can have hills, this can be in any sort of shape. Okay, but it's, it's kind of like a, a plane that's been, that's been bent around in some way. We don't care about the exact form of the shape. It's not just a, it's not just a, a straight plane. It's just, it's a surface. It's it, it, in this diagram. It's a two-dimensional surface. Why is it a surface and not like a, like a, solid, like like why doesn't it fill that part of space? Wait. Wait. Oh, okay. Yeah. So this is going to be a surface. Um. Right. So. So, we construct this, this manifold. Now, theorem. These manifolds partition thermodynamic state space. Partition means every point, in this case it's a three-dimensional space, every point in this three-dimensional space belongs to exactly one surface. Exactly one. So if you think about it, Sparsh, that that asserts that what you just said is impossible. You will think it will prove it in a minute. Right. So so every partitions thermodynamic state state space means the any point in thermodynamic thermodynamic state space belongs to exactly one surface. Proof. So it's proof by contradiction. Suppose that some point P belongs to the intersection of two such surfaces. So let's say there's a surface here. I'm sort of trying to bend it down, sort of thing. And there's a surface down here, and I'm going to sort of bend it up, and it just touches at one point. There's another one there. It doesn't have to be bending down. I mean, it's probably not going to be bending down. It's probably going to be close to this one, but it doesn't matter. And suppose they touch at one point, and I'll call the point P star. <coughs> Oops. Yeah, OK? Suppose they touch there. Well, what that means is that this point P star is reachable from a point on the top surface in a quasi-static a diabetic process. And also this point P star is 
reachable from uh, this point, let's say it's directly below P2, is directly below P1 in the sense that um, this, is, this vertical axis is U, and here you have V and all the XKs. So this is the same V and XK, these two points, but different internal energy. So this point P star is reachable from here, and it's also reachable from here. That's if you assume that, that they have a point in common. All right, now, so what if I start at this point here? And now if I go straight up, what that means is I'm not changing any of the mechanical variables. I'm not doing any work if I go straight up. This is a pure heat process. Pure heat transfer process. This is why we wanted these axes here to be just these mechanical variables, work variables. Yeah. Wasn't it idiomatic? And like, are we doing work or just providing if we go straight up, what, I want, what I'm saying is that let us remove the insulation okay. and input heat without changing any of the mechanical variables, volume for example. So that's in purely inputting heat and no work is being done. That's, this, that's a vertical process. So that's a pure heat transfer process, the amount of heat Q. Now, I get to here, and I do adiabatic work, no heat transfer to here. I know how much it does, it's PW1, how much work is done. And going here is work W2. W1 plus W2 is I know the W total, W, in getting from P1 to P2 via P star. Purely adiabatic processes. Because these two planes intersect, there is an, an adiabatic process, work process that joins P1 and P2 with work done W. But what have I done? I've got an, am I've, I've got, I've got an amount of heat Q. So I've, I've got in a cycle so that means I'll come back to P1. That means that change in internal energy is zero. I've gone in a cycle and I've input an amount of heat Q and I've converted the entire amount of heat Q into work. The entire amount of heat Q has been converted into work. But according to Kelvin's uh, Kelvin's formulation of the second law is impossible. You cannot get, yeah, you cannot input a definite amount of heat Q and extract exactly the same amount of work from it using adi these adiabatic processes from a single reservoir. So the existence of this intersection point P star leads to a contradiction. So there cannot exist an intersection point P star, which means that these surfaces partition the state space. So the picture is something like this. The state thermodynamic state space with, 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 these, with these axes is partitioned into these disjoint sets of points. And now let's just pick a particular V and XK here in the domain of U, particular fixed mechanical variables. And let's just go straight up, like this, straight up. At any point along here, there is a particular internal energy. Now this, this is at, for this particular point V, XK. I go up, I'll just go straight up. What do you think happens? At any point along here, 
there is a particular internal energy, here another particular internal energy, here a particular internal energy. So what have I got? I've got a function of u, v, and xk. It's a function of u because uh, if anyone, any point here is, is given a particular u, a unique u, and the v is unique, and the xk is unique, because it's one point there. So by going straight up like this, I have assigned to all of these points a particular, I, I can assign a particular number, u, depending on u, v, and xk. If I pick another number here, I can, I'll have a different u's, different v and xk. But what that's saying is that I've got a function of these variables, which we'll call s. And so I've proven the existence of this function s. We call this function n. So each manifold, what I'm saying is each of these manifolds can be labelled by a unique real number. <clears throat> and for each vxk, you can move from one manifold to the one above it smoothly. And the vertical path defines a continuous function uv of uv and xk. We call this function the entropy function. And it's a function of these numbers, yeah. Professor, was it the manifolds are like this? Then you will be able to cross cross them in a vertical manner. If they were what? If they're vertical. They're not vertical. If they were if they were uh, vertical, then it says that there are many possible internal energies for the same V of XK. I mean like um, that's not a function. So we're just showing that U is a function. Yeah. Um, basically the S is uh, is like it is a plane in 3D space in this case, right? Mm -hmm. As in, I'm, I'm saying that I can define this function in this way. I haven't said what it looks like. But no. You can, yeah, yeah, you can. Well, it, it, if it was a function of just S U V, yeah, it would be, it would have some. Obviously, it would be a, a surface, yeah. But but what exactly? I, I, I couldn't quite understand. Is S the value? Is S the value of something? Or it's. I can. I what what I'm saying. Is that if I go vertically up like this, at any point along here, there is one of these manifolds yeah. passing through, yeah. and I can assign a particular number. I don't care what it is. It could be some distance from here to there. It could be the internal energy at that point. I don't know. Yeah. Go up, and any point I can I can assign a unique real number. Is it the same number? No, different because it's because u is going up. Oh, okay. Yeah. And basically, I can assign to each of these a real number. So, what that says is that depending on three variables, u, v, and x, k, I have I have this I have mapped I've got I've got a mapping in this case. Let's say that's just a single variable. I've I've got a mapping from R three to three to to R. So just, I've just uh, constructed it. Mm. Uh, does the path has to be uh, straight? Yeah, in this case, it, it just, just makes it easy to make it straight. Yeah. Does, can you have any... Of course, yeah, but um, in the, what we want to do is to, is to show that we can, that all the points in the space have been partitioned, and we can assign to each of these surfaces a single number which means that we essentially can assign, uh, we, can, we can map the entire thermodynamic state space, in this case, that sets R3 to R, the single real number. It's, 
But this is a completely different idea of entropy that, that you're used to. This would be the only bad that works. Sorry? This, I think this would be the only bad that works all the time. Otherwise, you have a chance of traveling automatically. I think that, um, yeah, you know, it's just for convenience. Just a standard, it's a standard type of um, way of pretty, I mean, uh, de constructing a standard construction. It's necessary that every point in space lies on at least one curve, one manifold, right? Mm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's necessary. Yeah, yeah, sure. Because we want to show that it's a function of state. And so we've, this, this is a function of state because these surfaces partition the whole of the related space. Anyway, that's it. So basically you can have like one point and then another point directly to it, right? Then that, that, that would mean that the same V and X they have to have different values of you. Okay, so that's that's that. Now that's that's actually very interesting, um, very deep. Um, but I won't talk anymore about it. Anyway, so let's just finish off today's lecture with the part that you need for the assignment, and um, we'll just go through the postulates of the remains. Right. So, postulate one. There exist particular states called equilibrium states of simple systems that macroscopically are characterized completely by the internal energy U, the volume V, so V, and the mole numbers capital N1 up until capital NR of the of, of the substance that you that you have. Um, if I just read those words out, it is not immediately obvious, but it is true. If you can specify an internal energy or say a number that depends only on V and, and only on V N and, and N one up to N R, then what it says is that you don't need to specify how you got to this value of V. And, uh, you don't have to specify anything that happened in the past. Just one, one, one uh, aspect of this. Okay? The system has no memory of how it got to the state U, V, N. No memory. So thermodynamic systems uh, have no memory in equilibrium thermodynamics. All right, U, V, N are extensive variables. And what does extensive variables mean? Except sometimes you use the word parameters, sometimes variables. Uh, meaning, if you have lambda copies of the system and you join the copies together, then the new variables are lambda times what they were before. You have lambda copies of the system, so it's lambda times as big. It means that all of these extensive variables have become lambda times as big. Can you think of a variable that is that does not behave like that? Temperature. Temperature. If you have the temperature, if you have a system in equilibrium mm -hmm. and it's at a particular temperature, you double and if you add another system in the in equilibrium at the same temperature to it, so join them together. And, and, it's the, and they're both uh, exactly the same thermodynamic states. You put them together. The volume doubles. The number of moles doubles. But the temperature stays the same. So temperature is not an extensive variable. Temperature is called an intensive variable. Pressure, likewise, doesn't change. Pressure is an intensive variable. So another way of saying it is that extensive variables scale with the size of the system. The basic problem of thermodynamics is the following. Basically, in, 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 in essence, every problem in thermodynamics is this. It's just that 
in all the applications and all the other functions that you've heard of, like Helmholtz, free energy, or use free energy, or whatever, are just derived from this. This is the basic problem. So you have an isolated system, closed, and it is partitioned into two by a wall. There's a wall in here that's initially that, that initially it's fixed, but in principle we can we can unfix it and it's movable. So, and we have a subsystem on this side. Call it subsystem one. Subsystem on this side. Subsystem two. And. We start off with these two subsystems separately in equilibrium. They're not in any kind of thermodynamic contact here because of the partition. So initially they are separately in equilibrium at their own temperature, for example, here and another temperature here. Or one pressure here, another pressure here. Now the other thing to notice is that here you have extensive variables, U, V, and N. Extensive variables, all right? And the partition is insulated, impermeable, and initially it's not movable. Now what we do is we relax one of the internal constraints. And this partition represents an internal constraint that constrains either the volume, in other words, um, it's immovable, the number of particles, in other words, it's impermeable, or the heat transfer, in other words, it's insulated. If you, if you relax any one of those constraints, just one, exactly one, to start with, obviously you can have mixtures, do one at a time. Relax one of the internal constraints and you allow interchange of Q, or heat, or interchange of work, interchange of work by, by allowing the partition to move or allowing the partition to be, to be permeable to particles, you allow Q, W, N to interchange. And, and um, by, for example, um, allowing one side to do work and the other, or allowing heat to be constrained. And then you ask the question, after a long time, a long time later, a sufficiently long time later, because a long time is a relative concept, depends on the particular system. It could be billions of years for a galaxy, or it could be microseconds for uh, some um, superfluid medium sample in the laboratory. Uh, a sufficiently long time later, <coughs> What is the equilibrium state that eventually results after an internal constraint is removed? So in other words, we're asking about the equilibrium state for the entire system, isolated system. So initially you have two separate isolated systems and you allow them to interact thermodynamically. You're asking the question, what is the final equilibrium state? So for example, if only heat can be exchanged, we ask the question, what is U1 final and U2 final? So we know things like V1 final equals V1 initial if only Q can be exchanged because the partition cannot move, you only exchange heat. So the, the other variables are not relevant, they don't help. But we ask what is what is the final internal energy of system subsystem one, the final internal energy of subsystem two, after equilibrium has been re-established. Well, how would you answer this question? We'll think, okay, this is an energy, maybe we'll just use conservation of energy. So these the subsystem one was initially in equilibrium with itself. And so are subsystem two. We know what U1 initial was and what U2 initial was. It's, it's, it's a given, okay? It's a given in the problem. And so we know what the total internal energy was initially. 
since the system is isolated, no heat came in or out of it, which means, or no energy came in or out, which means that U total must be the same always. So in the end, when equilibrium is re-established, U total must be the same. Right? So we definitely know that um, the U1 final and U2 final, if you add them up, they must equal U total. All right? Must be true. Um, but the problem is, conservation of energy only gives us one equation, and we have two unknowns. One equation, two unknowns, it's not enough information to solve the problem. Right. <coughs> so, we need one more piece of information. This is the fundamental problem, but we know we need more than just conservation of energy. We need one more. We need to get one more equation. And where does that come from? So we need another postulate. Postulate two, there exists a function called the entropy of extensive parameters. We are focusing, for the isolated system, we focus on functions of extensive parameters only. The function of extensive parameters, um, and it's um, uh, extensive parameters in any closed and isolated system or composite system and is defined for all equilibrium states only for equilibrium states because otherwise you cannot draw a state in the state diagram it's not because the variables are not defined and this function has the following property in the absence of an internal constraint in other words when the internal constraint is taken away the values taken by the extensive parameters are those that maximize the entropy over all the possible given um, constraints on the same, uh, over all the possible values of the extensive parameters, or the possible, given the constraints uh, on the system. So in other words, if the Entropy is maximum given what the extensive parameters can be. So such a function is called a fundamental relation. So this function is, is S, the function of the extensive parameters. This function is called a fundamental relation. The fundamental relation contains all the thermodynamic information and it's accessed by differentiation. The information is accessed by differentiation once or twice. Okay. First or second derivatives. So all the thermodynamic information is encoded in the slopes and curvatures of the fundamental relation. <coughs> Postulate 3. The entropy of a composite system is additive of the constituent <coughs> subsystems. So the total, the total entropy is the entropy of subsystem 1 plus the entropy of subsystem 2 plus the entropy of any other subsystems. So, professor? Yep. So the entropy is extensive? Yes. What this really means is that the contribution of a boundary does not affect additivity. Um, what does well, that mean? Actually? Well, for example, a liquid has surface tension. You know, I, and so some energy is in the surface. Yeah. If I add two liquid samples together, an internal, um, uh, where, there was, where there were two surface tensions, something disappears. The energy, hopefully, what we want is that surface energy to be small compared to the total energy, so that the contribution of the surface is, is negligible when you join the systems. Also, the entropy function is continuous 
differentiable and a monotonically increasing function of the energy. Okay. Right. Uh, we'll get to the use of this in a minute. Additivity, as Convoy just said, implies the following property. Suppose you have lambda copies of the system um, with, with extensive variables u, v, n. There may be others. The total, which are the total internal energy, etc. The total internal energy, etc., of the combined system is then lambda u, lambda v, lambda n, etc. These are the this is by definition of extensive parameters. And by also by additivity, the total entropy is lambda times the entropy of one system. And therefore what we have is that the entropy uh, when uh, of uh, lambda times u and lambda times u, lambda times u is just lambda times the entropy of the small constituent subsystem. The total entropy of the new system is equal to the <coughs> lambda times the entropy of the constituent subsystem. So this mathematical property here, S of lambda u, lambda v, lambda n equals lambda S of u, v, n, is called homogeneous of first order. Homogeneous first order. Um, there is a mathematical proof um, by the boiler um, of, of this of, a, of, a, of, a, of, a, of this based on this, this type of property. But um, I, I don't want to do it. In other words, if you scale the system by lambda, the entropy scales by lambda. Now, the, so the entropy as a function of internal energy is monotonically increasing. So if I have the entropy on the vertical axis and you on the horizontal axis, the entropy, um, well, it can't look like this, but um, you will only know that next semester. But here is a monotonically increasing function of the independent variable. What does monotonically increasing mean? It means that, in fact, what we want is monotonically non-decreasing. But if we, it means that if we have um, u0 and u1, it means that um, if u1, u1 is greater than u0, implies s of u1 is greater than S of U0 for all U0, U1. So it's monotonically increasing, right? Uh, isn't that monotonically non-decreasing so it's greater than or equal to? Well, um, yeah. Yep. Yeah. But actually, I want it monotonically increasing. Yeah. Monotonically increasing. Uh, because what I want to be able to do is I want to invert this function instead of being s as a function of u, I want u as a function of s. Right. So we can, since it's monotonically increasing, we can invert it to get u as a function of s. And so just a few minutes ago we had a postulate, the, the maximum principle, the entropy maximum principle. Now when you invert after inversion, the maximum ent entropy, the, the entropy maximum principle becomes the energy minimum principle. Now that is something we prove um, in a few weeks' time, so properly. But for now, you can just take that as a given. But still, it's this inversion that I want to draw your attention to. That's why we want the entropy to be monotonically increasing the function of u. So we can invert it to get u of s. Um, in other words, we can talk about a fundamental relation in the entropy representation. So there is a fundamental relation in the entropy representation. This contains all the thermodynamic information. Or we can talk about the fundamental relation in the energy representation. This, con this also contains all the thermodynamic information. Right. Um, finally, nearly finally, 
Um, so since S is, um, since the entropy is homogeneous first order, let's choose the scaling factor to be one over the number of moles. You can scale it by any real number. So let's choose it to be one over the number of moles. So that means that one over N of the um, entropy of a single um, a single system must equal the entropy of the scaled extensive variables where the scaling is 1 over n. So it's u over n, v over n, and n over n. Oh, but n over n is 1. Oh, n over n is 1. So, but if u over n is the molar internal energy, the internal energy per mole, which is little u, V over N is the molar volume, little v, and it's N over N is sort of 1. So we have entropy as a function of U and V and 1. You don't bother writing the 1 all the time. So instead of writing the capital S, you write a little s, which I can make sure that it's kind of little. Sometimes I'll write little serifs on it like this to make sure that you know that it's molar entropy. So now that now now what we've done is we've taken a one mole sample of the substance and we've eliminated one of the thermodynamic variables. One mole sample, but this one mole sample tells us everything we need about the thermodynamics of the substance. Okay? Cost to the four. The entropy of any system vanishes. Okay, um, by now you should, you know, if English is not your first language, you should know that if something vanishes, it means it equals zero. In the state for which du by ds at constant all the other extensive parameters equals zero. The entropy vanishes in a state which du by the s equals zero at constant v and n. What we'll see next week is that means at zero temperature. Okay. This is also known as the Nernst postulate. Or Nernst theorem. In fact, in fact, it's a it's a theorem. It can be um, I think it can be um, derived, proven. Okay, so that's the postulates. And let's have a look at an example of a typical fundamental relation questions. So a PhD student from, um, I won't say which faculty? S lab. <laughs> finds the following function that he claims to be a fundamental relation. Indeed, just a master's student, right? Um, who didn't listen to my lectures properly. Is he right? So here is the fundamental relation. S equals, I'll just call this K. You don't have to worry about copying out all those. I'll just call it K, N, V, U to the power of one third. Okay? So you check, postulate three. Is it homogeneous first order? Is it monotonically, is this homogeneous first order? Let's check it out. S of lambda u, lambda v, lambda n equals k, lambda n, lambda v, lambda u to the power of three, which equals k, lambda cubed, n u v to the power of three, which equals lambda k, n u v to the power of three, which equals lambda s of u v n, therefore, homogeneous first order okay. monotonically increasing yes. okay. how do you know differentiate should be greater than zero yeah so 
ds by the u at constant v n equals something and it's greater than zero. ds by dv at constant u n. Don't forget this, you've got to write that in. From now on, every partial derivative that you write must tell us what is being kept constant. Because if you don't, it doesn't, because in thermodynamics, you don't know which variables um, you're talking about. You've got to know which variables you're talking about. Which, which, you're considering, you're considering S as a function of UVN, good. Okay, but in a few weeks, S could be a function of T, P, mu, um, at UVN, T, P, mu, lots of things. You've got to know which variables you are referring to. Grad zero, etc. Postulate four, now it's postulate. I'll leave that to your imagination. Okay. Um, we're not going to work that up the board. Oh, okay, so it's that, and you can read that for yourself. That's just um, that's just the type of question that um, you're probably familiar with. This is this. You don't have to. Uh, for this question here, you can just read it. Uh, this just um, is an example of the point I made before about if you have a paddle in, in a liquid, uh, you, can, you can put in a known amount of work into the liquid. You can do a known amount of work on the, on the substance. And uh, this just shows you how to do it. Um, you don't have to worry about this for the exam or anything like that. Okay, this is just an example. This here, this top example here, well, it's just the kind of problem you should have done in first year. Right? It's just revision. Um, it's good. It's good revision. You just have a look, make sure it's, it's reasonably familiar. Right. Um, and these are the questions. And the assignment will be. Um, There are f f uh, five of these are physically acceptable fundamental relations. Um, find, or oh, it's going to be out of the entropy ones. Find the fundamental relation. In invert the function to get the function of um, internal energy. It's out of those ones. And that one, and this is going to be in the assignment too. So question one ten three. Um, a subset of 1101 and one, question 1102 seems to have disappeared. Is that a misprint in Cullen? Or have I just not photocopied it? Look. Oh, that, that is 1102. I've copied it there. <coughs> so it's basically going to be um, these, these three questions, a subset of this question. And question 1102 and 1103. Um, that's what the assignment is. I haven't, I haven't written out the assignment yet, but you know what the questions are, so you can try them um, if you have a little bit of time on, on the weekend. If it doesn't, it doesn't matter because this is this is stuff, this is work for next week. But it would be very useful. Well, you, you're going to do it next Thursday anyway, so you're going to be familiar with it before the next lecture, which is good. It's really good to be familiar with the previous lectures. Um, when we do, for any lecture, please try to be familiar with the previous lecture's work. In, in this subject, SP2, much more than QM2, we really depend on previous lectures. What's going to happen is that your knowledge is going to not just expand in one dimension, it's going to expand in three dimensions, and you're going to uh, get an, uh, an exponential amount of knowledge, an expansion, exponential amount of uh, potential um, problems that you can solve. Okay? And you've got to be familiar with it, with, with the work as we go along. Try your best. And, and, and I'm always available by email if you have any questions. Also, I have, I'm in the middle of investigating, as I said before, some kind of um, class um, either social media or some way that we can exchange uh, questions and answers quickly so everybody can be in contact with everybody else 
and also with me uh, at any time, basically. Um, I would not use a smartphone, I've only got a dumb phone, but I'll use a PC. Um, and um, I'm, Google um, um, Classroom is out of the question, so it's way too, too, too big. So I'm either looking at Line or Google Groups at the moment. I think Google Groups is perfect, it could be perfect because um, you have subheadings. I don't know if Line has headings. I think with Line you just get a, a, a conversation, yeah. Yeah. Some, some, somebody's comment just comes yeah. up. And so you're just going to get you know, a long line of comments and they're going to be about all sorts of things. Whereas it would be nice to be able to put those into categories. So with something like Google Groups, uh, you've, got a, you've got a heading and then you've got a hot thread. So that's the, that's the type of structure. Yeah, forum structure is better. So I'll look into, I'll look into Google, group, Google Groups on the weekend. So we can have you know, the same Google Group, but one forum, one forum for um, SP2, one forum for QM2, uh, one forum for Life, the Universe, and everything. And yeah. yeah, maybe something like like a blog in which you could you could propose would also be okay. Mm. But blog is um, I mean, the, the structure of a blog is is centered at at one person. I mean, is it centered around the post? Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, but I, I like the idea of a of a, of a forum. Okay. Because it's it's more democratic. <laughs> <laughs> Except there is a moderator. There's a dictator. Who <laughs> 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 wants to be a dictator? Yeah. Anyway, so I'll look into that on the weekend, but I want to get that up and running by, by next week sometime. Yeah, so that uh, we get to exchange hints and tips for, for questions. Right? Uh, when I did this at uh, the University of Western Australia about seven or eight years ago, it was hugely successful. Um, but the difference is that uh, we had a factor of 60 or 70 more students. So that made, it made a big difference. So this is a much smaller group, but still, maybe um, uh, it still might work. You know? yeah. It depends on how you access the forum. I mean, uh, it would be great if you could do it by smartphone, and so you can access it anywhere, anytime. Yeah. yeah, and get like notifications. Yeah, notif get notifications. That would be good too. Yeah. Anyway, so that's that for today.